James Oren Blakely was born on May 8, 1972, and went by Jimmy. 17-year-old Jimmy was a student at the Bethel Christian Academy in Hava de Grace, but had unfortunately dropped out. He didn't start school until he was 8 years old and dropped out after completing the 8th grade because he was older and bigger than his classmates. However, he continued to attend school and church functions. He was described as a very easygoing and well-mannered kid from a close-knit religious family. He was said to be friendly, but was also shy, and you generally had to approach him first. He loved to cook and had dreams of owning his own restaurant. He was also known for collecting model cars in his spare time. In 1990, at the end of March, Jimmy bought himself a 1985 Chevrolet Cavalier from the money he earned while working as a service attendant at the Conowingo Shell Station in Delhi. On Sunday, April 1st, Jimmy left the Shell Station at 10 p.m., wearing his Shell Station uniform and was spotted at the U.S. Adult Bookstore on Pulaski Highway in Edgewood an hour later. It's here that Jimmy most likely met someone and left in his vehicle, never to be seen alive again. The next morning at 10.20 a.m., a fisherman found Jimmy's body at the end of a secluded dirt road about 150 yards from Emorton Road near Otter Point Creek. His cause of death was a single stab wound to the chest. While there were no signs of a sexual assault, he was found with his pants down and his shirt open. His cavalier was then discovered back in the parking lot of the adult bookstore. When the car was located, investigators discovered blood on the hood, but not inside the car. They believe Jimmy was murdered where his body was found, and the suspect fled in his car before abandoning it back at the bookstore. It would later be revealed that Jimmy was a frequent visitor of the bookstore and had become acquainted with members of the gay community. Unfortunately, all the leads the detective had led to a dead end. They even posted flyers inside the bookstore, as well as other bookstores around town, but no one ever came forward with a solid lead. It's now been over 30 years, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Julie Lynn Ferguson was born on January 11, 1978, in Landover, Maryland. In 1995, 17-year-old Julie worked part-time as a cashier at Linens and Things in the Greenway Shopping Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and was a student at Eleanor Roosevelt High School with dreams of becoming a journalist. At about 9.45 p.m. on March 20, 1995, she left work, called her mother, Pat Ferguson, and told her she didn't need a ride home because some of her friends would be picking her up. She then walked to a liquor store that was in the same shopping center and purchased a can of soda. By 9.50 p.m., Julie was back in front of Linens and Things, sitting on the side of a brick flower box, drinking her soda while waiting for her friends. Several witnesses recalled seeing her there, but when her friends arrived at 10 p.m., Julie was nowhere to be found. Her can of soda and a plastic bag containing some of her belongings were on the ground near the flower planter. Julie was known for being a very responsible teenager, so her friends were immediately concerned that something might have happened to her. So they called Julie's mom to see if she knew where Julie was, but she told them that Julie should have been at the shopping center waiting for them. She rushed over to the shopping center, hoping that by the time she arrived, Julie would be there with a good explanation for where she had gone, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. When Pat saw Julie's belongings still on the sidewalk, she immediately knew something was wrong and called the police. Eight hours later, Julie's body was found in a park off of Daisy Lane in Glendale, Maryland, four miles from where she had been abducted. She had been strangled and suffered a fatal neck wound, but there were no signs of sexual assault. Plus, her jewelry was untouched, ruling out robbery as a possible motive. Her ID card was found on the median of Greenbelt Avenue, about halfway between the Greenway Shopping Center and the park where her body was found. This was the only item of hers that was recovered after the murder. To this day, her purse has never been found. Unfortunately, the shopping center had no surveillance cameras, so detectives had to rely on eyewitness accounts to piece together Julie's final movements. Several people told police they saw Julie outside around 9.50 p.m. 
One of those witnesses reported seeing Julie talking to the occupants of a mid-1980s red or burgundy Volkswagen Jetta that had pulled up alongside the curb. She had been under the impression that Julie had known the people inside the car as she was leaning in one of the car's windows while she talked to them. The car had three people inside, two men and a woman. Another witness came forward and told police that they had seen two of the three occupants from the Jetta inside the liquor store shortly before Julie vanished. Then a Greenbelt resident came forward and reported seeing a similar car in the area shortly before her body was discovered. That witness lived off of Daisy Lane and had driven past the park in the early morning hours and noticed the car pulled over on the side of the road. The headlights were on, but no one was inside. Another witness reported seeing a black Ford Mustang 5.0 pull forward and then back up and speak with Julie. The driver was possibly a white male, but there are no other details. Julie would have allegedly never gotten in the car with a stranger, so investigators initially believed she knew her killer. However, after a lot of detective work, they concluded that a stranger had somehow abducted her. I believe this is the most plausible theory, considering some of her belongings were left behind. Five years later, in 2000, investigators once again made a plea to the public for information on the three people seen in the Jetta. However, it didn't lead to their identifications. At one point, a local mechanic by the name of Doug Da Silva was considered a suspect since he had a previous sexual assault conviction and lived close to where her body was found. Plus, he was not able to provide an alibi for the night she went missing, but his DNA didn't match the DNA found at the crime scene. Investigators still think he could have helped in her murder, but he's since left the area and they've been unable to track him down. In October 2023, investigators believe they finally found the owner of the red Jetta, but haven't released any details. They might also have some leads on the driver of the black Mustang. Sadly, as of November 2023, her murderer has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Lorraine Zimmerman was born on April 26, 1968, and went by Lori. Her mother described her as an innocent girl who still enjoyed being read bedtime stories. On the morning of April 6, 1984, 15-year-old Lori woke up for school after spending the first night in their new home at 820 Concord Street in Hagerstown, Maryland. When Lori was ready, her mother, Sandra Long, called a taxi to take her to South High School. Sadly, she would never see her daughter alive again. After school, Lori took a bus to her aunt's house near Washington Square to see if they needed help moving. Shortly after 4 p.m., Lori left, walking in the direction of her home, but sadly, she would never make it. When Lori failed to arrive by dinner time, her mother became frantic and went out searching for her. After being unable to find her, she reported her missing. Eight days later, two people walking in a wooded area off Reno Monument Road found what looked like a cardboard box on top of something. When they moved the box, they shockingly found Lori's partially nude body. She had been beaten, suffocated, and sexually assaulted and had a foreign object lodged in her throat. With no leads to go on, the police brought in psychic Dorothy Allison. Dorothy would say that a janitor at Lori's school should be looked into. She also mentioned a man by the name of Chuck Bernstein. As for the actual suspect, she said he wore glasses, sometimes a wig, and was possibly an officer in disguise. She said the killer was driving an old yellow car when he picked Lori up as she was walking down the street. She even mentioned the numbers 1 and 7, which police concluded was plot 17 that Lori was buried in. She then gave the name of a suspect who she believed murdered Lori. That name has never been released, but it doesn't matter because police could never find a suspect with that name. Unfortunately, while some of her information was correct, like details about the murder that were never released to the public, it never helped solve the case. Sadly, Lori's parents and best friend have since passed away. The good news is they still have the DNA preserved, and hopefully, someday, it can lead to the true killer. However, as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Felicia Simone Barnes was born in Georgia on January 12, 1994. 
In 2010, 16-year-old Felicia was an honor student at Union Academy in Monroe, North Carolina, set to graduate a year early. Once she graduated, she had plans to attend Towson University near Baltimore, Maryland. Around Christmas in 2010, Felicia was visiting her older half-sister, Dina Barnes, in Baltimore, with whom she had recently reconnected with. Dina had been dating a man named Michael Johnson for the last 10 years, but they had recently broken up. On December 28th, Dina went to work and left Felicia alone at the apartment. At some point, a witness saw her walking to the Reistertown Road Plaza. It was during this walk that she allegedly went missing and was never seen alive again. That same day, Johnson had stopped by to pick up some of his belongings. He was then seen carrying a 35-gallon plastic tub out of the apartment. When Dina arrived home later, Felicia was nowhere to be found. On April 20, 2011, at 7.30 a.m., workers spotted a nude body in the Susquehanna River near the Conowingo Dam. This location is around 45 miles from where she was last seen. Using dental records and a tattoo, the police were able to confirm the remains belonged to Felicia. Interestingly, while police were recovering her body, they stumbled upon the body of an adult male who was unrelated to Felicia's murder. Johnson, who had no prior criminal record and was generally considered well-behaved, became a primary suspect since he was one of the last people to see Felicia alive. Two months after Felicia disappeared, Dina filed for a restraining order against him. I can only assume she did this out of fear that he did something to her sister because I was not able to find a reason for the restraining order. Leading up to the murder, the three of them had been very close. Michael thought of Felicia as his little sister and even called her little sis. However, while they hung out, they allowed Felicia to drink and play explicit drinking games when she would come to visit. It was also discovered that a sex tape had been filmed in June of 2010 of Johnson, Dina, Felicia, and Johnson's younger brother engaging in sexual acts after going streaking together. Johnson had tried to touch Felicia that night, but she allegedly swatted his hand away. After Felicia's body was found, Maryland State Police wiretapped Johnson's phone, and he was recorded discussing the case with family members. At one point, he strangely said they wrestled on the day she went missing and was wondering if his DNA would be under her fingernails. However, no DNA was ever recovered from her body. A year after her body was found, on April 25, 2012, Johnson was arrested and charged with her murder. They alleged that Johnson strangled her and carried her body out in the 35-gallon plastic tub. However, that was the only evidence they had against him. Well, except for testimony from a known petty criminal named James McRae. McRae said that Johnson confessed to him that he had suffocated Felicia with a pillow and that he had seen her body inside the apartment. However, it was later discovered that McRae had a history of making false statements and was therefore an unreliable witness. Leading up to her visit, Felicia and Johnson had exchanged hundreds of phone calls and text messages with each other. However, those messages were not sexually explicit or suggestive, but prosecutors felt that he was grooming her and was being careful with what he said. For six months, he sent a total of 1,200 text messages. On the day of the murder, prosecutors alleged that Johnson had planned to be alone with Felicia and had turned his cell phone off and called out of work. On February 6, 2013, Johnson was convicted of second-degree murder. However, on the day Johnson was to be sentenced, a judge overturned the conviction in order to retrial due to James McRae's unreliable testimony. In 2015, the judge in the second trial declared a mistrial, and again in 2018, saying the prosecutors failed to prove the case. The defense has said that Johnson did not have time to murder Felicia, clean the apartment of forensic evidence, and dispose of the body within the time frame given. Baltimore City Police still considered this case the most vexing missing person case they've ever investigated. In 2012, a bill named Felicia's Law passed and requires the state to publish a list of missing children along with statistics and a list of volunteers who can aid law enforcement in the search for missing children. Johnson then filed a $750,000 claim against the homicide detective who investigated him, but it has yet to be settled. As of 2023, no one else has ever been charged for her murder, and this case remains unsolved. What do y'all think? Considering there was no forensic evidence linking Johnson to the crime, she was never seen returning to the apartment, and she was not found in a plastic container. Let me know in the comments below.
Mary Frances Kelly was born on September 20, 1959. After graduating from Bel Air High School, she married and had two daughters. Her first marriage ended in divorce after her husband began suffering from severe psychological problems and had to be hospitalized for several years. It was said she only left because she was worried about the effects it was having on her daughters. She then married Frank Kelly, but he died in 1984 from bone cancer. He was originally given six months to live, but survived for three years. During this time, Mary worked the night shifts at Whiteford Packing Company and later at the Bata Shoe Company in order to support her family. In 1988, 28-year-old Mary was unemployed and enrolled in college classes at Harford Community College. She was described as a very loving mother who was known for baking cookies for her daughters and taking them to their Brownies troop meetups. On April 21st, Mary got a babysitter and went out for the night. While waiting for the babysitter to arrive, she received a call from a male acquaintance asking for a ride from Andy Wargo's restaurant and bar in Forest Hill. After picking up the person, the two went to Friar Tuck's restaurant in the Rock Spring Shopping Center, where they had several drinks. After that, they ended up at his home in Churchville. She allegedly left the home between 1.30 and 2 a.m. and was never seen alive again. When she failed to show back up the next day, the babysitter took the girls to Mary's mother's home. That's when her family realized she was missing and decided to go out looking for her. During the search, they discovered her 1980 Chevy Citation at the Royal Farm Store on Fountain Green Road, two miles outside of Bel Air. Mary used to work at the Royal Farm Store, and her sister was still employed there as the manager. At that point, her family reported her missing. When investigators inspected the car, they found a small amount of blood on the exterior of the car. They also found her pocketbook in the front seat and her keys on the floorboard. Investigators then organized a search for Mary. They had received a tip that she was murdered and dumped in the Bynum Pond, but divers never found anything. Another tip came in that she was in a field behind the Bel Air roller rink, but once again, it was a dead end. Months later, on September 26, a painter went into the woods to relieve himself and found Mary's skeletal remains. This location is in a wooded area off Patterson Mill Road, just outside of Bel Air. Unfortunately, the police have been very tight-lipped about the details of the case, such as her cause of death and who are suspects. I did find that her first husband was looked into but ruled out. I can only assume that the man she picked up on the 21st remains a suspect, since investigators have never officially said he was ruled out. They also stated that they were looking into two individuals around the time Mary was found. However, it's now been over 30 years, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved.